Hi. Um, so yes, I'm uh, I'm James from uh, Signet, where I work as a, an applications analyst. And today I wanted to give an overview of the Swift parallel code that we use for uh, cosmological and astrophysical simulations. Now Swift stands for SPH with interleaved fine grained tasking. So if nobody's heard of SPH, it's smooth particle hydrodynamics. It's a way that we um, discretize the space and uh, how we simulate it. But I'll, I'll move on to that in a, in a couple of slides time. But I just want to preface it with we, so I was a, uh, I am a developer of Swift and we created it in uh, a sense of, we wanted a, a modern uh, a cosmology simulation that made use of the all of the new architectures that were coming out in HPC. And we wanted to create it in a way such that anybody could implement physics or astrophysics in it without knowledge of uh, in-depth parallel computing or in-depth knowledge of C. I just wanted to give a brief overview of that. Okay, so I'm gonna start by giving a motivation of why, why we would want to create Swift in the first place. Then I'll move on to the problem that we, we want to solve. And then I'll show how, how we do this using SPH. And then from that, I'll go through how Swift implements SPH using task-based parallelism. It's another way to uh, parallelize the, the physics. And then I'll go on to a series of optimize it, further optimizations that we use to speed up particle interactions, uh, particle time stepping. And then I'll finally go on to how we effectively load balance this across uh, multiple uh, CPU nodes uh, with MPI and domain decomposition. Okay, so uh, in astronomy, we want to, specifically in cosmology, we want to predict the, the evolution of the universe. And in order to do this, what we do is we, uh, we create a simulation of the universe and evolve it over time from, from the Big Bang and then evolve it to the current day. And then we take the, uh, the galaxies that we form in the simulation and compare it against observation to corroborate that our models are correct. So this is what Swift does. This evolves a, uh, a universe a simulation. And I just wanted to show a quick video of this, uh, which this is one of the Eagle simulations. So this is from very early on in the universe. And what you can see here is the, uh, the dark matter halos as they form uh, throughout the universe. And then slowly we should start seeing, yeah, so then we've moved over onto the, what we call the normal matter, the baryonic matter, the gas components. As you can see, these form around the, uh, the filamentary uh, dark matter halos uh, as they're bound uh, via gravity. But as we can see the, uh, the gas inflowing and forming uh, a proto galaxy. And then we can see the star view here. Uh, and as you can see, so the, the red is, is the hotter particles, and we have the blues outside uh, the galaxy formation here. But this is this is what we want, this is what we want to achieve uh, with Swift. We want to be able to evolve uh, from a, a collapsing glass gas cloud into uh, individual galaxies to show what what we've predicted in the model actually matches what is observed with telescopes. So, yeah, so that's just one galaxy of many across the, the dark matter halo. Okay, so in order to do this, what do we need? So the universe is mainly made up of uh, three principal components. So we have dark energy, dark matter, and normal matter. 
The dark energy is very easy to simulate as we can just absorb it into uh, our choice of coordinates. The dark matter uh, can be simulated as treating individual uh, bodies as they evolve uh, through the gravitational force. And then normal matter, the baryonic matter, is treated as, as an ideal gas. So again, this gas is simulated with what I'll, I'll come on to is the these SPH particles. And then the hard, the further we go down the list, the harder it becomes to simulate. So the the furthest physics, so the, the sub what we call the subgrid models is star formation, black hole formation, and neutrinos, dust, planets. These have become uh, more, more difficult to simulate just because of the complexity of the physics and the, the various properties that we need. So these are our constituents. We can form the initial conditions based on known observations from the cosmic microwave background. Uh, and from that, we impose a set of conditions. So the boundary conditions is we assume they are periodic as space is homogeneous. So it looks the same everywhere, very which way we look. So we can assume these, these periodic boundary conditions. So then we have all of these the dark matter particles, these normal matter particles. Uh, and then in order to evolve them over time, we need to create gravitational forces. So this is how dark matter interacts with normal matter. And then for the gas, we use hydrodynamics to evolve them over time, as well as, as gravity. And then there's further other forces that we can we can implement. I won't go on to these in this talk, uh, but magnetic fields, radiative transfer, cosmic rays, these are all part of the um, the subgrid models, which are also simulated in, in SWIFT. So th this is the recipe that we need to, uh, to create our universe. So, from SPH, what we what we do is we can um, for each particle throughout the volume, we can compute any properties in that on from on that particle using what's known as a a smoothing kernel in SPH, and what we do is we sum all of the contributions from each of their neighbors within a given distance, what's known as the, the smoothing length. And based on the distance, each of the contributions are weighted. So particles further out in this radius here have a, a lower contribution than particles closer in. And we use this, it's known as a, a smoothing kernel to calculate, calculate these properties on the particle. OK, so that's what I'm going to move on to next, uh, the SPH aspect of the simulation. So as you can see, we've what we do is we discretize the space into these series of particles, which represent the gas. And each of these particles has a, a fixed mass. And the density is defined by the, the weighted sum of all of the particles in a given neighborhood. So as you can see, the, the density differs in this space by orders of magnitude. So particles which are in this sparse region here require the same number of neighbors as particles in these dense regions. So we typically want 50 to 100 neighbors to, to calculate the density or any other properties. So we need to vary the smoothing length based on the density of the region. So this particle here will loop over all the particles in its surrounding neighborhood and calculate the weighted contribution of the density from its neighbors onto it here. Then how it does this is it uses this 
this weighting function uh, described in the in the previous slide uh, to compute this quantity. But not just density, you can use this uh, this technique to compute various other uh, quantities of interest and using it here. But this also illustrates how how different the density is within the region. So if you have all the particles in this region, you'll have a very high uh, computation, uh, a very high computational intensity to compute. So it makes load balancing of these problems uh, very difficult. Because if you just split this domain into quadrants, some nodes will get a uh, very, a very light workload, whereas other nodes will be faced with a very heavy workload just because of the density of the problem. So typically, the traditional way to do this is to use uh, what's known as a, a, a tree based algorithm. Because if, if you think a, a naive method would be to, for each particle here, you need to sum the contributions for, for all of all the particles in a given neighborhood. And then this, this goes is, is n squared, which is a very uh, expensive way to compute the interactions. But what we can use is a, a tree-based algorithm uh, in order to do the neighbor search. In 3D, it's an octree, but I just simplified it here into a, a quad tree in two dimensions. So what we do is we create a tree and for each leaf node, we recurse down until we get a few number of partic particles in each uh, leaf and then perform a tree walk on any given cell in order to determine its neighbors, in, in order to determine the contribution on, onto that particle for the density, for example. This, I think this then it speeds it up to n log n uh, in computational complexity. So it's much better than the naive implementation. And this has been used in, in a lot of the literature in gadget, uh, gasoline, platinum, et cetera. Uh, yeah, it makes sense. It's it's easy, it's robust, and you can, you can parallelize it fairly easily. Uh, what Swift? does differently is we use, uh, we, still, we still use an, an octree structure, but we use uh, what's known as an, an adaptive mesh refinement. So we decide, when we decide, when we create the tree, we make sure that the, the cells are no bigger than, are no smaller than the smoothing length of the particles. So what this means is, each each cell which contains the particles will only ever need to interact with any of the neighboring cells. So we know this particle here only needs to know about these surrounding eight cells. So we can forget about the rest of these cells when we talk about the contribution of this particle. We aim to choose a refinement such that we have 500 particles per cell, just so there's enough computation there to schedule this task uh, before recursing further down the tree. So this is, we still use a, a, an oak tree, but I need to stress that we don't need to then walk the tree when we determining the, the neighbors of this particle compared to the, the traditional methods. So we'll con so this is only one particle in this cell, but normally there's multiple particles in this cell. This is just a simplified example. So we'll contribute, we'll calculate the contributions of the particles in other particles in this cell, which is the what we call the self task, and then each of the pair tasks which is each of the surrounding neighbors, each of the, the pair of pairs of cells. And what this means is any of the, the cell pair interactions or the cell, the, they do not need to be computed in a given order. 
a specific order. There's no, yeah, we don't, don't need to have a predefined order. So this helps us when we come to schedule these tasks on the CPU. The only condition that we need to make sure is that no two threads are acting on the same cell at the same time. Because then we will face race conditions and that will will uh, will make our well will make the answer incorrect. And cell pair, yeah, so cell pairs can have vastly differing uh, workloads depending on how many particles are in each cell. But what we need to help with this, we need a dynamic runtime scheduling to make sure that each task is run in parallel and the this condition is met, that the no two cells are acted on by the different threads at the same time. So what we do in Swift is we use what is called task-based parallelism. So in, in typical, in shared memory uh, parallel programming, we face problems associated with concurrency and load balancing. But what we do in task-based parallelism is first reduce the problem to a set of interdependent tasks. So that's what we've done. We've created a, a self task for the particles in an individual cell. And then we've created a series of pair tasks for each of the neighboring uh, cell pairs. And then for each task, we need to know which task uh, it depends on. So for example, in SBH, we need to compute the densities of the particles before we can compute the force on them. So these force tasks, so say, for example, these are a set of force tasks. These depend on the density. So this arrow here represents a dependency. So this force task depends on this density task to run before it itself can run. So this density task now has no dependencies, so it can run whenever it needs to, whenever it wants to, whenever a thread comes along and picks it up. But then we also need to have what we, we term a conflict. So this is when a task operates on the same cell as another task. So this is uh, this is when we make sure that no two threads are acting on the same cell. So that's what the dashed line represents here. So as long as there are no conflicts, this task can run. So to set this up, we have a series of tasks. And then what, what happens is each thread comes along, picks up a task, makes sure it has no unresolved dependencies or conflicts, and then computes it. And once it is finished computing the task, it removes the task from the queue. And then it makes sure that this dependency here is satisfied on this other task. And then the, the obviously the, the conflict will also be removed as well because then another thread could come in and operate on that same cell. So we've, we've set this up uh, with our own open source library called QuickShed, which has been implemented into Swift. But what it allows is if, if a thread has a, a, a high uh, computational task to perform, which takes a while, it can operate on that. And then at the same time, we, another thread can operate on a either a low workload task, but then it can do multiple low workload tasks in the time it takes for this thread to do the, the higher the higher workload task. So that we, we can uh, better balance the uh, the cores running on the CPU. So this is a, a typical uh, series of tasks in, in Swift when we want to calculate uh, all of the forces on a given bundle of particles in one time set to say. So at first we have the drift task. So we move all the particles. 
This has no dependencies, so this runs at the start. And then once this is run, this makes sure that the dependencies, so for the, the density, it satisfies all these uh, dependencies on the, the density task here, which is comprised of the pair and the self tasks. Then when this these series of tasks are finished, then we'll we'll let the um what this is known as the correction the go stack. So instead of having a like a complete all to wall between the density tasks and the force tasks, we have these go between tasks, which just makes sure the density is all finished before we move on to the force. And then we run the second loop, which is computing all the forces on the particles given the densities calculated in this previous step. And then that's finished by uh, performing the time integration. So that this is when we kick all the particles or update their velocities based on this, the acceleration computed from the force. So as I said, each individual task is, is very simple. It's just the, the physics involved. There is no... Uh, there's no complication with worrying about race conditions like implementing mutexes, um, anything anything uh, related to, to parallelism or thread safety. Because of the way we've set up the tasks uh, and the task-based parallelism framework, you don't need to worry about this when you're implementing tasks. There's a no, no deeper knowledge that you need in, in C for this, so which this makes it easier to extend the code and for more astronomers, physicists who want to implement new physics, it's easy to extend that way. This, uh, so th this is uh, from a, a real run in Swift. This is just showing all of the tasks involved with a lot, all with the, uh, the dependency graph. Uh, it's it's more complicated, but it just shows again drifting the particles, computing the density, uh, computing the force on each particle uh, based on the density, and then also a series of gravity tasks, which again can run in parallel to the the SBH as long as all of their dependencies, of course, are satisfied. You can also see these uh, receive tasks here. Now these these are based on these are the the MPI communications. So I'm going to move on to that uh, in a couple of slides, uh, but it's just to show that these can also run at the same time as all of the the other tasks uh, involved. So what this is is it shows the uh, each thread running on a node. So this is just on one node, one CPU. And then each, each colored bar here represents one single task. So as you can see, all the blue tasks are the, the drifting of the particles, followed by the density calculation, and then the force and, and so on. But what it shows is each task can be interleaved with other tasks that it doesn't have a dependency on. And it shows that, say, uh, they say this thread, for example, has a big density task here, which blocks it off for quite a long time. All the while, all the other threads are doing smaller tasks in the in this same time. And what it means is we can more evenly load balance across the whole CPU, across C, uh, across cores on the CPU, meaning that when we when we finish, all all of the cores are fully utilized for the, the entirety of the run. We're not waiting on, on one core at the end to finish a long task and all of the other cores are idling. So this is the power of task-based parallelism. It shows how effectively we can load balance across these uh, CPUs. Because as, as CPUs uh, uh, into the future, we are, we are getting more and more cores per CPU. Uh, I think some of the the AMD ones have 128 cores, uh, if not more, uh, from from AMD. So this this is why task based parallelism is uh, is very important. 
Okay, so the, the MPI communications aspect of it. So these are, this diagram shows the, again, the, the tasks. So we have the density tasks down here. Remember, this is a conflict and the forces depend on the, the density tasks. But at the same time, we have, so we, we have cells yeah, local to a node, but then remember cells which are touching uh, the boundary between nodes will need to have the particle positions or densities or whatever from the neighboring nodes. Uh, and we need to send this via MPI. What this means is this, this communication is set up as a, as a separate task, which is still within the, 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 the framework. And there is no, there's no uh, synchronization waiting for all the communication tasks to be sent before we start computing the density. The, these density tasks can run in parallel while we're waiting for the communications to come in. So what this means is the only this task, this pair task here just needs to wait for these positions to be sent, but all these other tasks can execute at the same time. So what this means is we can we can hide the 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 latency, the overhead of the MPI communication with more communication, sorry, more computation internal to the node. So this way we avoid the overhead of the MPI communication. Yeah, so it's, it's just another task type. Yeah, we execute in parallel with the rest of the computation. So all that happens is once these positions are sent over, we'll unlock that dependency on the on that MPI communication on that task. And then this uh, this computation can occur. All that happens is we'll check back periodically. So these are all asynchronous communication. We will check back periodically to make sure the, the, the data has arrived. If the data has arrived, then we can unlock that task to be, uh, to be run. Again, this is another uh, example of how powerful task-based parallelism can be. And then the same happens on the other node. We wait for data coming from this node here. So this is just another uh, another uh, task graph that I showed uh, for a single node. Now it's across uh, eight nodes. But as you can see, even across eight nodes, we have fairly uh, good at the parallel efficiency. And most of the nodes are finishing roughly at the same time. There's a bit of, uh, there's a bit of wait time here between these nodes, waiting on other nodes to finish, but it's 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 fairly small. But as I'll come on, come on to later, it's it's not a trivial it's not a trivial task to uh, evenly distribute the workload over uh, over nodes. Uh, but I'll show that later in in, in our our technique and in how to do that. Again, yeah, this this proves how how effective task-based parallelism is. So if you still don't believe me, uh, we performed a, a weak scaling test uh, on the Cosmorate uh, Dirac system at Durham in the UK. This we did up to 360 nodes. So what we have here is uh, the speed relative to, to one node. So we've done a weak scaling test. So all that does is we have a fixed number of particles here on one node. And then what we do is we scale the number of particles, the problem size with the number of nodes. So we'll increase the number of nodes with the problem size. So we've gone from nearly two, two billion particles here up to uh, 10 billion here, all the way up to a trillion particles on running on yeah, 360 nodes. So the ideal case is if this line was flat across here, but as you can see, we are very, very close to this flat line showing how well we, we weak scale with the number of nodes in the problem size. So this is when we ran 
uh, eight MPI ranks per node on these AMD CPUs, where we, I think we run one MPI rank per NUMA region on the, on the CPU, and then run uh, threads per MPI task on top of that to, to process the tasks. Okay, so I have 25 minutes left. I'm going to go into further optimizations. And the next, the first one is the, the particle interactions, how we optimize that. So as I said, we, we decompose the domain using a, an adaptive mesh. Now we need to compute all of the interactions within a cell and between pairs of cells. Now from pure uh, a geometry argument, particles in this cell here, when they interact with particles in the corner cell, will have much fewer inter interactions than a, an edge on case here, an edge B, because if a particle is, say, well here, just in the middle, for example, it the smooth and length cuts this neighboring cell at a much smaller area than a, an edge on cell here. So a lot of the particles are gonna be out of range of this particle in this cell. So there's no need to uh, compute further calculations, but if we did a, a naive N squared calculation where we just looped over all particles in this cell and all particles in this cell, we would find that most of the particles were out of range of each other. So we've wasted a lot of effort just trying to work out which particles are in range. So what we decided to do is implement uh, what we call a, a pseudo overlay list. What this does is, so we have our two neighboring cells here. And obviously this particle is not, very likely to be in range of this particle, say. So why, why should we compute the full 3D distance to it? Why don't we project the particles onto an axis which joins the center of the two nodes and then work out the distance in one dimension before we work out the distance in three dimensions? Because in one dimension, it's, it's easier to compare and make sure it's in range or not because so for example, we have a particle here. We want to move along this axis. Now we have the distances of, so we store the distances of the particles on this axis. And then we work out based on the, the smoothing length, whether they are within range in one dimension. Then if they're in range in one dimension, then we compute the 3D distance. Because then, we know at least if it's not in range in one dimension, it's not gonna be in range in three dimensions. So there's, it's a waste of time in compute computation in working out the distance in three dimensions. So this way we can optimize the, the particle interactions by only computing uh, the, the distance in three of these, a subset of the candidates uh, between, neighbors, between neighboring cells. We get the, the best, speed up and performance in the case where the cell is, is corner on because most of the particles are going to be out of range. So we store uh, the, the solid in, uh, distances between each of the uh, eight axes joining the neighboring pairs of cells. And we, we, we store the distance. So then we can compare the distance against the spoon length of each of the particles. But another good aspect of this is we can move along the axis as we compute further and further into the cell based on the smooth length. And we know if this if the smooth length it doesn't uh, it doesn't reach as far into the cell, we can discard further uh, particle interactions because we know they're going to be out of range. And this is what I was uh, this is what I helped with uh, and I was able to parallelize with, with uh, vectorization. 
but uh, yeah, I'm not going to go through the, the vectorization aspect today. Okay, so we've looked at particle interactions, but we haven't talked about the the time stepping or the drifting of particles, how we move them about and give them velocity. So all these two graphs are showing is how how the densities uh, in the in the volume are varying on orders of magnitude. So in the very dense regions, we have very active particles with high velocities as they have so many neighbors in a small uh, a small volume. And this means that we need to have a very low time step for the dense regions. But then in the sparse regions where particles have very far away neighbors, we can think of these are more boring regions. The particles are sluggish. They don't move around as much, not at the same speeds. So those time steps are, are quite large because not much happens in a given time step of the dense regions. So what we wanted to do is, is optimize this time stepping so that we didn't need to compute the, uh, the drifting of particles on all of the all even the particles in the sparse regions uh, for every every time step of the simulation. So the, the, the classic way to do this is use the, the leapfrog algorithm of velocity value is to, to kick the particle for the, for the given time step or half the time step, then drift the particle. So this is move with the particle fully for a given time step and then kick the velocity again. So you have a full time step there. So this is based on, so where every particle has the same time step, that is the smallest time step in the whole simulation. So even, we're even moving the particles in the sparse regions where nothing, not much is happening uh, at the same granularity as the, the dense regions. So this is, this is the time to solution we get. We have the fixed DT, so all particles have the same time step. Uh, and you can see it's overkill for the particles in the sparse regions because not much is happening in the same time interval uh, when you compare it to the, the dense regions where the, the moving at higher velocities uh, forces are stronger on them. So this is a time of solution. And then this dashed line is the ideal case if we had 100% parallel efficiency. So as we move up, the, the number of threads, the time solution goes down, obviously, but we move away from this ideal, ideal parallel efficiency line. But we can go one better than this. What we can do is we can use the, uh, we can perform operator splitting. So what this means is we can split the drift. So we keep the, the kick the same, but we can split the drift how we move the particles into multiple, uh, uh, like multiple uh, computations. So this is the this is over time as we kick the particles. These are for the uh, the regions which are very sparse. So we don't need the same granularity as the the very active what we call the very active regions, the dense regions of the simulation. We can split it up into much smaller. Uh, finer grain time steps uh, compared to the the sparse regions. So for the sparse regions, we do like one kick, one drift, and then one kick. Whereas in the dense regions, we'll do one 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 kick, but then one very small drift, then another very small drift, uh, multiple times over the same time as we do one kick for the. Uh, the sparse regions. So this, what this does is we can, so if we do this localized time stepping, that's great because we're reducing the number of computations that we need to perform, but we need to select which particles are what we call active and which are inactive based on the regions. 
but then we need to maintain lists of particles, active and inactive particles, and in order to uh, to perform these calculations, which is again more memory consumption. And what time what turns out is we are adding more logic to the calculation proportionally compared to compute. So we are decreasing the compute. Or we're increasing the the logic involved with the uh, with the calculation, which means, as I'll show, so we've drastically reduced the uh, the time to solution, so in two orders of magnitude, as we drift in everything, in in the way I've just said, but what happens is the parallel efficiency goes down because we are performing less computationally intensive tasks with the logic compared to when we were just doing all drifting every particle uh, with a fixed time step, uh, which provides more computation. But it, obviously the drift all is better because we, we, we have a, a better time to solution. It's just the parallel efficiency goes down. But we can go another step in Swift in, so in the canonical algorithm, we drift all particles to the current point in time. But do we actually need to do that? No, we only need to drift particles, which are neighbors of what we call active particles that need to be moved forward. As we can calculate in the, the contribution on of the force onto these particles. So what we can do is we can perform a tree walk across the tasks in each of the parts of the domain and activate tasks which have particles neighboring the active particles in order to still perform the full uh, force calculation and keep it accurate. So we can do uh, better again compared to the drift all scheme, what we do in, in Swift. But again, as I said, we're adding more logic to the calculation versus uh, we're reducing the computational intensity, the parallel efficiency uh, goes way down as we drift more and more away from this ideal case. So with this scheme, compared to the, the fixed DT, we are 107 times faster but the uh, yeah, as I said, the, there's not there's not there's not enough stuff to do. There's not enough work to do on the processor because of this uh, more complicated algorithm, as we add more logic to it. So that is that is the that is the challenge going forward. Is given how do we how do we load balance this effectively uh, across multiple nodes as only a few particles are active at any given time. Yeah, so say we have a trillion particles, but only 10 particles are active. How do you effectively load balance this on a thousand nodes? So our domain decomposition strategy is, so a naive way to do it would just be to take the domain and split it into, into cubes, into blocks, and then split that across each node. But what if you have a very sparse region on one of these uh, blocks, then you'll have one node not really doing much work. So this is uh, very uh, inefficiently load balanced. So what we do is for each task, we'll work out a, a runtime, like how much com computation is in the task. And we'll use this to create a graph where the data is each of the nodes and the, the tasks are the, the edges of the graph. And we will uh, we'll add an extra cost for communication between, between, the, uh, between the nodes and we want to minimize this. So we want to maximize the load balance. In order to do this, we need to minimize the communication. So it's a, it's a balancing ask even here to, uh, to get the best load balance. And to do this, we feed all of this 
data into a library called Metis, which splits the graph such that the work, but not the data, remember, is, is balanced across the nodes. So some nodes might have a greater volume of space in order to balance a node which has a smaller volume, but it has much more denser regions, so more activity is happening there between particles. So when we, we feed through Metis, we'll get something similar to this, where we have, so this, this blue MPI run, for example, on one node has much more denser regions compared to either the, this purple node, which has sparse regions, but it has much more cells. And we want to minimize these boundaries between the MPI ranks in order to lower the communication overhead, as we really just want to have a uh, computation uh, running on the CPU. So this, this graph is essentially showing so for any given time step, the number of particles which are actually updated. So as you can see up here, so this is what, nearly a billion particles. So we very, oh no, so this was on a, a 4 billion particle uh, simulation. We can see how, how few steps we actually update all particles at the same time. Most of the, the updates are when there's much fewer uh, particles to update. And this how this is how it's so hard to uh, effective, effectively load balance across across nodes uh, when we implement this uh, smart uh, time step scheme in Swift. So I've got 10 minutes left. I think I can quickly move on to IO. There should be a short slide, I think. So we have two strategies in Swift. We have HDF5-based snapshots, uh, which uses uh, MPI-IO under the hood. So we'll have these, uh, I don't know, every 100, every 1,000 time steps, we'll dump all of our data uh, into these HDF5 snapshots. And you can make use of compression in this HDF5 library. Uh, and on, on Cosmo, we can achieve a 30% 30, 30 peak of the Lustre parallel file system when we're not compressing. So this is this is one way to implement the snapshots. The only downside being you have these synchronization points uh, throughout the simulation where you have to stop all the computation and dump everything to disk. We had one PhD student who implemented a new scheme, which is called continuous simulation data stream. So instead of having these global synchronization points, what if we track each individual particle and every time it changes, so every time one part of the particle changes, we add this change to a log file on the node. And this takes place as, a again, another task in task-based parallelism. They can all happen at the same time. But what this means is we can sort of do a, a lazy write to the disk in the background without having these big global uh, synchronization points. So it's sort of you, you track the position of the particle every time it changes, then you add this change to the file. But it's such a small write to the file, it, it doesn't uh, severely either hamper the, the file system and slow your code down as everything has to stop and write everything to disk. Oh yeah, so one final point before uh, I can finish, before questions. Uh, at the same time, Swift has been used not only for cosmology and galaxy evolution, uh, we had one student uh, adapt Swift to perform uh, planetary impacts. So Jacob uh, used Swift to perform a, so I'll just show you the, the simulation here. So this, this is the Earth, and you can see sort of a, a proto-moon proto collide into the Earth. 
and then you can see how the tidal streams all merge into the Earth, and then you have the the final uh, smaller moon start to orbit the Earth. So it's it's just funny how you can you can simulate a, a planetary impact with as a as a as a fluid it has a gas. So this is all in in SPH and uh, obviously gravity is in there as well. But this is another use case of SWIFT. Um, I think I've got five minutes left. So I think I'll end it here.